I'd like to say a few words about um, my trajectory uh, as well as my, my passion for science and for advocating for students in STEM with the hope that really uh, it contributes to the larger conversation this morning about true access. And so indeed there are many reasons why I stand here today and uh, we can think of a few. Of course there's hard work paired with some luck a young mother who sacrificed for me, uh, teachers who recognize my potential, mentors, advocates, finding my love of science through access and experience, my ability to communicate science, my interest in helping others like myself, and resisting against the notion that I am an, anom and an anomaly. So while this is uh, not a science seminar, I, I really do have to give you a little bit of the reason why I get up out of bed every day, and that is because I'm a passionate scientist. Um, so this will be quick, but I just have to give you a sense of this. And uh, so my lab, um, I'm very interested in studying the brain, of course, as a neuroscientist. And we study the brain at the molecular and uh, cellular level. And what that is is really trying to understand what's happening at synapses. And synapses are the point of contact between two neurons. Uh, and the modification of synapses, the ability of them to be weakened or strengthened, is really what underlies learning and memory, our ability to recall memories, our ability to form habits, our ability to interact uh, with our environment by perceiving through our senses. And so, uh, what my lab has been doing over many, many years has been understanding how synapses work uh, and how they, their dysfunction in disease. And so uh, just a couple other things here. I wanted to show you this here. So I work with rodent animals. And uh, just one point of contact for this morning is that uh, experience and environment does matter. Uh, for instance, what you see on the left here is a standard cage with animals in it, mice. However, if you put mice in a cage with lots of uh, toys and a running wheel and change those things every day so that they have a novel experience, what happens is that you actually change the makeup of their brain circuitry. In fact, what happens is that uh, compared to what you're looking at here are two neurons. And it compared to neurons from an animal in a standard cage, what you actually have is that environmental enrichment increases those synaptic connections, meaning novel experiences, the novel experiences that we have throughout our life um, actually drives changes in our synaptic circuitry. So that's really important. And I'll make a point about that later. Uh, the other thing is that it turns out that the number of these synaptic connections are something that a lot of scientists think about with regards to disease and health. Um, for instance, I study Alzheimer's disease, and so what happens in Alzheimer's disease is that the number of these synaptic connections decrease. As you see here, there's lots of other, other disorders like schizophrenia and aut autism spectrum disorders uh, where the, the number of these synapses are altered. Okay, so um, that's all the science you're going to hear. The VEX is going to be really about my story. Uh, but the reason I bring it up is uh, for the following reason. The first thing that you must know is that I absolutely love science. That's why I'm standing up here. <laughs> and I'm a big science nerd. <laughs> also, that we've learned a little bit here. We know that communication between neurons takes place at synapses and that synapse number and function can be modified by environment and experience. Um, we know this from animal models. We actually know this in humans also. And that this can be altered in disease states. OK, so that's the summary of part one. This is UC San Diego. And uh, just so happens that my lab is in the Ravel campus, the Patrick lab. Um, and whenever I say that, it's kind of, it's, it makes me feel this giddy kind of feeling of, wow, I have a lab. I've had one for 15 years. But when you think about it, let's, let's, let's look at my um, the last past 14 and a half years, just in this slide. I've had almost 10 PhD students, uh, several postdocs, 
These are students, these are individuals who've already had their PhD and working in my lab after their, after their postdoctoral studies. Um, undergrads and many uh, high school students, lots of funding, people who have worked with me over the years, but really how does that all happen? So let's look at my academic journey. It all starts where you can take Google Earth and zoom in and look to where I was born and raised, and that just what happens to be South Central LA. And in fact, uh, I was born to a mother of 16 years old, and she had the wherewithal to make sure that I used education. A young mother knew to instill in me that education could be my biggest advocate, one of my biggest advocates to get to where I wanted to be. And so, uh, born in LA, um, raised in South Central, Compton and Watts, uh, graduated from a high school called King Drew Medical Magnet High School in, in uh, 1988. And I was a smart kid, right? I loved science, I was a smart kid. Uh, stayed out of trouble in some sense. In many cases, uh, I, my colleagues and, uh, excuse me, my, my, my cousins and friends uh, actually kept me out of harm's way because they knew I was the smart kid who would maybe go do something with my life. And that's something I did. I went to Berkeley for undergrad. And while at Berkeley, it was a culture shock. I got there, it was hard to adjust, and my first two years were a disaster. However, I gained experience and I gained access to a research lab which allowed me to start thinking about the possibilities of what I could do with my life. I learned how to advocate for myself and I had mentors and mentors who did, that, did not know that they were my mentors. Eventually I went on to graduate from Berkeley. Uh, I thought I wanted to go to med school uh, but luckily I was able to get into a master's program at UCSF. This program uh, literally gave me a chance to understand my propensity and my capacity to do science. Uh, I remember staying on the phone with the, the organizer and the leader of this particular master's program and they didn't want to let me in because I had such horrible grades. However, uh, they took a chance on me and I literally kept him on the phone for an hour. Um, and from that conversation, we, asked, we, we think about it now, we said, Gentry, what if I had not let you into this program, what would have happened? But he did, and I thank him for that. I went on to get my PhD in a speedy three and a half years at Harvard. And that was another culture shock to me, but I was focused, I, I had um, advisors and mentors, and I really dug into the science that I was interested in. Came back to California and did my uh, postdoctoral training at Caltech. And so that's the trajectory that I took. I quickly came back because the East Coast was not a place for me. <laughs> uh, I definitely wanted to get back to California. Uh, and luckily enough, someone gave me a job. I interviewed all over the country, but UC San Diego was a place for me, and I'm so happy that I came. So joined the faculty in 2004, um, was promoted to associate professor with tenure in 2011, and just recently promoted to full professor in 2017. So you got to think about my trajectory. The question is, really, how does a kid from Compton, California become a full professor in neurobiology at UC San Diego? And the answer is access, mentorship, and advocacy. And I think that is uh, some of the most salient, important aspects of a young person's trajectory as they're figuring out what they want to do with their lives, as well as um, these novel experiences that can drive those changes in their brain. So the last thing I want to bring up is something that I've been very interested in over the past few years. About three years ago, I actually thought about leaving UC San Diego, and I'm glad I didn't, because um, I had a very nice offer to go elsewhere. However, I stayed because I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something special that could change the landscape at UC San Diego. And so what I created was a scholarship program called Pathways to STEM through Enhanced Access and Mentorship. It's very deliberate. It was a program that fills in all the gaps. And this is a, 
picture of our first cohort of students from here in San Diego. All these students were from San Diego. Some of them were homeless. Some of them uh, did, you know, their personal identity struggled. You know, they were smart individuals. They made it into UC San Diego, but there was going to be a lot of work that needed to be done to make sure that they knew that they could be successful. And I'm happy to say that after this first year, these guys are on a great trajectory. Uh, so what's the mission of this program? It's to increase the number, the persistence, and the success of under-resourced, underrepresented minority students in STEM here in San Diego. That's now expanding across California with um, the recent support and partnership of Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. What does PATHS do? It really does fill in all the gaps. It's a four-year incubator scholarship program, four plus. Um, these kids get a full ride to UC San Diego. I'm very thankful for the local support, uh, as well as uh, uh, the support from CZI. This program is really built to build strong personal identity and a vision of each student. Turns out that, you know, when you look at students on paper, they look exactly the same. Uh, but when they get to a place like UC San Diego, what happens is that they start to falter when they don't have advocates or mentors or begin to understand why they belong or their own personal identity in STEM. Uh, and so that's something that we really focus on. Um, we meet the fi full financial need. There's embedded tutors. There's embedded graduate advocates. They meet with faculty weekly at lunches. Um, there's study sessions together. This group is really um, like a family, and uh, it's basically pulling out all the things, the salient aspects that allowed me to be successful and putting it into this program. And uh, obviously, it establishes this network of mentorship in a hierarchical way with student, peer student, peer mentors, um, with graduate students, as well as faculty. And so, um, when I started this three years ago, I really talked to a lot of people across the country, as well as here in San Diego, and we know that our partners are philanthropy, of course, community organizations, academia, the STEM industry, local government, and of course our pre-K-12 education system here in San Diego. But who do you think our number one partner would be? Of course, you guys are pretty smart. <laughs> the student is our number one partner, and I wanted to put together a program that really championed the student, and that's something that um, I think we have to think about. We have to think about how we're not just developing uh, pedagogical tools that really are focused on data that isn't really thinking about the student and what they need um, uh, in time and space. And so uh, the student is our number one partner. And just to show you this, this was something that was announced just a couple of weeks ago. We're very thankful for uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for their generous um, partnership and uh, funding. Uh, we think that we're going to be able to do something very special here at UC San Diego and across the UC system, as this is also a collaboration with UC Berkeley. So in the summary of part two, what I want to make sure you guys remember, what do you think the first thing is? I still absolutely love science, <laughs> and I am a big science nerd. I think you, you have to realize that students need to understand and maintain their passion for whatever it is they want to do. Um, access, mentorship, and advocacy are crucial, and that the student is our number one partner. There's also a power of storytelling. I, I've been amazed at what I've heard already this this morning from these students. There's a power in storytelling, so we need to be telling stories and making sure our students are, are hearing that, such that um, we must help our youth find and tell their own stories. So thank you very much.